Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, marhaba, bienvenue, welcome. And all the other languages uh, uh, that you all speak. Welcome to this face-to-face -face conversation we have today uh, on the theme of the event, uh, Religion and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. We have two wonderful uh, speakers today uh, who I would like to introduce. Uh, my own name is Leila El Zweni. I'm the moderator of today. Um, and we have uh, Kautar Darmoni uh, as one of our speakers today. She is the CEO of Atria Institute on Gender Equality and Women's History in the Netherlands, originally from Tunisia. She has an academic background in gender studies from the Université Paris-Sorbonne and obtained her PhD at the Université Lumière Lyon II. And she is a speaker on female leadership and has been active in various international women's movements. Welcome. Merci. Kautar. Um, our second uh, guest today is uh, Mr. Jos Dauma, who works as a diplomat for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Welcome. Uh, in 2019, he was appointed as the first special envoy for religion and belief. Uh, and in that role, he promotes freedom of religion and belief abroad as well as attention for religion within the work of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs at large. Before his current position, he was ambassador of the Netherlands in Slovenia, Iran and Georgia. Welcome to you as well. Thank you, pleasure. Uh, we have agreed to uh, be informal, so I will address you both with your first names, Kautar and Jos. Um, the set of, of the conversation, uh, we wanted to have a little bit of a lively uh, conversation. Uh, so we have a bowl in the middle with a couple of statements. Uh, each of you is invited um, to pick one uh, of the papers, read out the statement that is on the paper, and then answer it. And then the other person uh, replies, and hopefully there uh, is a, a lively conversation. There's uh, cards also that are wild cards. There's no question on it. You can yourself ask a question if you wish to, to the other person. Uh, because you are the special envoy of religion, Kautar has a strong uh, background in feminism, so we hope this uh, will really... And uh, religion as well. And religion as well, but uh, that's true, and hopefully you'll also have some experience with feminism. But the idea is that we don't agree on all sub subjects, but we have a, a lively conversation, so that stimulates the thinking also. So we must disagree. You... <laughs> uh, it, I will help you to disagree. Okay. <laughs> Okay, even yes. if we don't, then she will Indeed. make us. I will. Let's I agree will. to disagree. Agree to disagree, that's <laughs> the basis at all. Uh, and we also have, uh, we want to learn also from your different backgrounds uh, very much, because you haven't uh, been uh, in discussion before, you haven't met each other before, which makes it uh, easier to, uh, to have very uh, thought-provoking uh, discussion. Um, you have an escape card as well, in case the question surprises you too much, you can give it to the other person, but still you have uh, to answer it. Uh, let's see how it works. Uh, we, uh, we really want to, to get the best out of you, of your knowledge, your experience, your thinking, and um, let's go. But the first question I will ask myself to both of you, uh, I will ask uh, with you, uh, I start with you first, uh, what does religion mean to you? Personally or professionally? <laughs> I think both uh, are mixed also, but... Uh, uh, it's a very... I am religious by choice. I was born religious as Muslim. I left Islam, so what we call in Arabic al-murtadda, the um, heretic. There you get a death sentence for it in the Muslim community if you do so. So I took that risk and I chose to leave the religion. And then after when I was living in Europe, I decided to go back to the Islam as well. So that's, I am Muslim by choice, not by culture. And because it's, I think it adds an extra dimension to my life personally and to lead the life that I'm leading with purpose. That's very interesting. I hope uh, the reason why you went back to religion and choose Islam again would be very interesting to hear. Let's see uh, when it comes up in the discussion. Thank you. Well, and I'm yes, religious as well. You are uh, religious. By born, choice? Born, born Christian. 
but yeah. at a certain age, you make the choice yourself. Yes. Uh, you could stay, let's say, in your own religion as a sort of tradition. Many people do so, no doubt. But uh, many people also make this deliberate choice, and I made that deliberate choice. So I believe in God who created and so on. So um, for me, it is part of my daily life. Some people criticized when I was appointed, is that really possible? He's partisan. Partisan, what he's, does that he's mean? Part of, he's partisan, he, he is part of that culture, so mm -hmm. how is he able to judge independently and objectively? Well, then my slogan is uh, that only he is impartial, he who is partisan, God. who ah. has made a choice, because you recognize who you are, and that's why I like uh, this being your first question. Yes. Uh, it, is, yes. it is important. Yes since being objective also in this, in, in, in advocacy and, and so on, is very difficult. So it's better to know what are the drivers of a certain person. Certainly, the choice is very important and I think we will discuss that because not all the people perhaps choose uh, for religion or are conscious that they are born in a certain uh, religious uh, community. Um, and thinking about that, uh, that's exactly what we want because choosing who you are and to whom you belong uh, and also seeing the commonalities, I think, uh, well, we will also see the, the not commonalities perhaps, but I will invite uh, you first, if I may, uh, to pick a question, a statement, and uh, yes, we have, <laughs> of course, to do, <laughs> we have the COVID rules of distance, eyes closed, yes, and let's see <laughs> the opening statement. Alors, uh, cultural parity, should be central in our work. Cultural what? Parity, 50-50. Yeah. Or whatever, so this is what... I want, yes, uh, let me elucidate that a bit because the first idea was cultural sensitivity should be part of our work, primary part of our work. But cultural sensitivity, of course, has, uh, yes, another meaning for you can, you know, negotiate universal rights. So this, the statement now is cultural parity. So no culture is superior to the other. Can we really, can we really integrate that to our work? Uh, that's the question. To me or to well, yourself? Well, first you answer the question and then okay. I hope uh, you will uh, react. I mean, of course parity in the general sense of the word because usually we use a lot of parity in gender studies like 50-50 men, women. So I would like to change the <coughs> word parity for the word inclusivity to start with, because that's even more deeper than parity, um, which means also I take you, I in include you as you are. I don't have to change anything at you. It's, I don't necessarily agree with you, but I embrace you as such. And I think it's not anymore a matter of choice to have that, it's a just a fact. This is what we see nowadays also with, for example, Black Lives Matter, and etc movements rising around the world where people are not anymore accepting that they are not part of that parity anymore, but they are taking and they are um, exige, huh? they are asking and they are demanding for that presence. So it's no choice, it's a must. It's a must, but do we see this uh, in practice? Because it seems like uh, there's more polarization than uh, inclusive. No, but this is what happens yeah. nowadays also because there is no, there is no, um, it's not anymore a nice to have, it's a must to have, so which means also you get more clashes because yes. people are not willing to ask and to beg anymore, so please, can you allow me? It's like, no, I have the right as much as you to be here. So, and that creates more tension because now it's, it's a moment of truth. I think 2020 and the advantage of the corona at the moment, which is a global crisis in the whole world, we are reaching a moment of truth on all levels, political, religious, environment, gender, finances, everything. So that's a moment. I think I'm very happy with this clash, actually. So there's a positive element in a very negative situation. So it's a useful clash. Very much. But you th you're thinking in confrontation, I mean, it's, in a way. This is what, of course, I mean, if I go to the Dutch model of polder, uh, compromise, uh, harmonize, uh, which is wonderful, but there are moments where you have to have this little clutch yeah. to go to the harmony again. A catharsis, it's, you mean? Mm, it breaks open. Or sometimes, yes, yeah. the chaos. 
It's yeah. to have chaos to be able to go to a new order. I, I understand that. that that's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's functional to have a catharsis, to have a clash. But on the other side, of course, it's regrettable in a way. Uh, you, uh, and that's why I like the history of this um, uh, statement, because it started with understanding. Sensitivity. Uh, oh, yeah. sensitivity. And sensitive. then you make it parity, and parity is indeed a statement, whereas uh, as, um, empathy, uh, understanding is, is, is by itself more open. Um, for me, that has always been part of my definition for tolerance. Uh, we in the Netherlands, we always were tolerant, at least we were known to be tolerant, because we lived next to each other in, in pillars, nowadays we call it silos, and we live in our silo, in our bubble, uh, quite easily, and we say, oh yes, you also have the right to live. But we, we never were confronted with each other. And then comes your challenge and your confrontation. Then we need to accept the other as she, he is. And uh, one moment. So, uh, and that's, um, that, that's, that's now a fact of life. And in the past it was not. So this is, this is a very welcome opening statement because now we know we have to face the music and reality. But how would you do that then in your work? If you are uh, dealing, you are a special envoy for religion. So how do you go about? So to uh, countries where there are other religions, where there are in Holland, for instance, uh, in our own ministry perhaps, there is a discussion whether Islam, to name it by the name, is, is not part of the history of Holland, of Europe. How do you then enter the discussion? Okay, we are all equal. We, I mean, the discussion generally is not, uh, we accept Muslims, uh, so let's talk uh, and, and, you know, be equal about that. Yeah. It's not the situation yet, your, like you in said. Your, in your framing, in How your, do you do your, that? your phrasing the question, you, 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 uh, your terminology was like citizens. But uh, apart from being citizens of this country, <coughs> we are also human beings. Yes. So then comes the acceptance. And uh, this, is, this is a very difficult task, to understand the other as she, he is. And um, that, that, that is conflicting. Uh, for instance, how people are dressed, uh, yes. wearing a scarf or not. The trick is, in the 50s, uh, the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, all men were wearing scarves, all men were wearing hats, and women were also quite often wearing hats, scarves or hats. Then it eroded, and then other people came wearing scarves. The first was ac acceptable, and the second one was not acceptable. Then you have to rethink and accept the person as she, he is, and think, hey, what's, what, this is how they are used to dress. And you have to learn to accept these people. And that's an uphill task. It's an uphill task, yeah. And we are trying to figure out how do you address that, because a lot of people, if they don't recognize something, they become afraid. Indeed. I think in societies there, where there's... There is no vision. What, what I miss... On one hand, I think Muslims and Islam is in the Western world and, for example, in Europe, and it's just a fact. It's, it's, you cannot go around it. It's just what it is. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, because on a global level, but let's take it European level, the tradition has been very, very secular, so there is no th such a thing as a r um, religious vision. Like also the same thing then uh, immigration vision. It's like in Canada, for example. I almost moved to Canada because of that. They have a very clear political vision on immigration. To regulate it, how do we want it? But they don't say, we don't want migrants. In Europe, we don't have this vision about uh, immigration to welcome people and to see how we're going to deal with that. And this is what we see also with the religious. There is a, there is an, 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 a deep um, a missing of religious vision in the European policy also in terms of political policy, because religion is something that should be private and anyway, we should not have it in the public sphere. I think it's not realistic. Yes. I fully Which agree to that. Uh, we, that yes. but, but, but I do not fully agree to your, let's say, your depiction of history. Uh, yes, Europe nowadays is secular, but in the, in the past, we were known to be a Catholic country, a, a Protestant country, even a Lutheran or a Calvinist country. And we are known, even secular, to be Calvinists. We don't know what, who Calvin was or what Calvinism is, but we call ourselves Calvinists whenever we are uh, frag uh, what is it, uh, frugal. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know the word frugal thanks to the discussions in Europe these days. It's Calvinist. Is it Calvinist? What, what, who was Calvin? We have 
forgotten about that. But it is important to understand each other and to understand the drivers of people, so also understand religious drivers. And that means that, uh, that uh, let's say, put ourselves here as a Christian and a Muslim, that means that you have to understand me and my drivers and I have to understand you and your drivers. How far, how deep that goes, I don't know yet. But this is part of my job, as you said, um, and, and, and this is part of our reality. Um, we have, we have to, um, to face that reality, to live with it and work on it. But also, I remember when I moved to the Netherlands, I asked also, I knew the history, I read it, but then I wanted to know what it is it, because like the, in the Dutch cultural identity, I figured out there was Calvinist. So then it was in a professor, a colleague of mine at the University of Amsterdam, a uh, historian, historian, and then he said to me, I said, but, but how, how uh, Calvinism, est-ce que c'est protestant, c'est catholique, what is it? And then he, he looked at me and he said, when you are in Holland, everybody is Calvinist in a way or another. Whether you are Catholic, Protestant, or Muslim, you are also Calvinist. And this is what I think also, religion is not only a spiritual uh, uh, dimension, it's also, it has also a, contra, a cultural aspect in, the, mm -hmm. in your identity. For example, I know people, they are very surprised, but I am very fond of Calvinism. I like Calvinism, not when it comes to body culture, but for the rest, I think it's a great asset, Calvinism. I like the principles. Mm -hmm. I am Muslim, but I'm also, in a way, Calvinist. But the, Part of the cultural identity is also the religious identity. And this is something I think with, when we are facing the challenge with Islam in Europe, mm. that we need also to respect the fact that a lot of Muslims choose, choose to have that part as a religious part as part of their cultural identity. I'd like to respond to a second element of your statement earlier on. And that was on the difference between, for instance, Canada and Europe. Uh, I've been in discussion with Canada on this exactly last week. Um, they were, and I, I know from my own past, they were an immigration country. So they attracted people to come to Canada. That means that you, you are selective, uh, very much so, and you also are open to them. Those who come, you are open to. We are not an immigration country, we were an emigration country in the 50s and the 60s. So we had to change and ex learn to accept people. That's different and that is, that's a learning process. And we're still in the curve, I hope, up. Yes, that's true. There's a lot, uh, Canada has, of course, more space and it was, uh, like you said, they were selecting they the have immigrants. They, they have issues. They have issues too, yeah. It's yeah. not uh, like uh, issues solved at one point. Mm. Uh, you both actually made very important points, namely religion. What is religion, indeed? Uh, is it theology? Is it a culture? Is it your identity? Is it something, actually, we all have in some sense in, in ourselves, even if we reject it, but at least you relate also to something that you consciously reject. So it's important to, to see that religion is not these men with beards in robes who are negative to women or who have certain statements that are not uh, fitting in daily life. So to humanize also that and to see, yeah, you can be Muslim and Calvinist and, 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 and Dutch and, and, and even Canadian, you can be mixed. So get out of your silos and, and not see religion as something and peace and women as something else. I think that is very important also. And also not only identified with the extreme opinions, because this mm -hmm. is what religion is like a kind of hostage of, it's like also, for example, the, the political debate. It's, 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 the, it, it's really uh, piraté huh, by the extremities. Whether the majority, which is in the middle, they don't have an issue. So it's like very often people um, uh, associate Islam with burqa and with men in robe, but it's not. This is a very small, very small, tiny uh, uh, voice mm -hmm. in the Muslim uh, uh, spectrum, which is much bigger than that, where women do play also an important role, but behind the scenes. So th this is also, it's very, it, it, it's like, it's a choice also to look at the men with the robes and with the beard and with the burqas. But they are a minority in Islam. This is also what the West like to focus on, only to focus on the shit. That's mutual. I think these extremes She's really... She's uh, the, <laughs> yeah, said the, the word. No, but I think we have to be very clear and, and say this is, I'm very happy that you are uh, speaking your heart, not only your mind. 
uh, because perceptions matter a lot and narratives are also important. So if these extremist groups are very important uh, or very good at uh, dominating uh, the perceptions and the narratives of what one religion is or what we are as a superior culture, and the majority in the middle at all sides they don't have a voice, they don't know how to articulate their middle position well. I think and they don't have a problem. They don't have a problem. The majority in the middle. They do not perceive a problem. Uh, yes. No. Yeah. Because it's, it's yeah, but we have many. There might be a problem, but they don't know it. <laughs> it's like we have now COVID-19 uh, and suddenly we're all in it. Uh, if you are black, white, Muslim, or atheist or whatever you are, we're all in it in the same way. So then you see it doesn't really matter, it all affects you the same way, like conflict does. And, and but I don't think it's, it's no. a problem of religion, I think it's a problem of patriarchal interpretation of the religion. Religion as such is not like religion or politics or whatever, is not a problem as such. It's the interpretation, what you give to that aspect, what makes it what it is. The, the, the issue, I, if I talk about Islam, is Islam, like many other religions, have, has been always dominated by patriarchal interpretation. So also the feminist voice in the Islam is quite new, and, but it mm. exists. So the female voice, the moment that women start making an interpretation of the text, you get a completely different version, completely different interpretation, while it's the same text. So also, who is giving a voice and interpretation mm -hmm. to that religious text? Well, you have, oh, there's one statement in there, is religion and feminism, can that go together? Is religion always patriarchal? I thought patriarchal? that was th the, the theme of today. It is, well, <laughs> there's a lot of themes But in you set the tone again. <laughs> well, uh, is religion... Do we have not to respond talking... to that or...? Yes, well, you can, yes, I'd like to hear your vision, uh, not because, only on because Islam. Because I, I agree with, the, with the, let's say, your, your, um, your statement that the interpretation of the religion, at least the two religions that we sort of represent, uh, has been patriarchal. It, it were men who were the theologians, uh, who they had the wisdom, and they were the authority. Um, we need to have that fresh look, and that is quite recent. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is painful to see how difficult that can be, uh, being in a Christian bubble. Um, we still have that discussion uh, postponing in some churches the choice about having women having, let's say, functions in, uh, in, in, in church, because we have to, to see those old texts who are true in themselves, like in the Quran and as in the Bible, with new eyes in the perspective of those days and these days. And that is a painful change for many, not only for the men, but also for the women. Uh, it is, yes. uh, so you, you, you might say that it is patriarchal, but it is also deep inside all of us, men and women. Yes, that is when belief becomes a truth, and that's, well, that's but, a very religious but fixed, discussion. Yeah, fixed, it's fixed also like, you know, Shirin, yeah. Shirin Ebadi, she's, she's an, an Iranian uh, activist and lawyer, and she, she did marvelous things. She says at a certain point, patriarchy is like an injection that we all have in our system, also women. Patriarchal are not only women, it's, it's, it's a culture. Mm -hmm. So women also can be extremely patriarchal. Well, then sim simply a blue trans Russian. <laughs> that now. would be very, you know, <laughs> if we could. Yeah. It, it, for example, ES. ES. Daesh. Yes. Yeah, the, the Daesh. Daesh, the recruitment of Daesh, where, when I made, I made uh, extensive research about it at the University of Amsterdam about sex jihad. And then Tunisia was the first pioneer country to send women. Tunisian young women who went to uh, Syria and Iraq as a sex jihadist. Yes. And it was really a drama. And the Could you explain a bit what uh, sex jihad Sex jihad, is? it's like uh, women, it's like when, 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 when you go to war, like the, the religious war, so you offer yourself for the biggest uh, cause. And sex jihad is uh, actually a movement that started via internet of women, young women, uh, 17, 18, who would go to these countries where the mujahideen were fighting in Syria and Iraq, and they would offer their sexual services and also kitchen they were cooking, cleaning, and sexing uh, with these gentlemen to motivate them and to encourage them and to empty their balls so that they can fight much, much better when they are on the field. So that's called sex jihad. Now, the recruitment of sex jihad, for example, in Tunisia and a lot of Arab countries are made by women, not by men. Women are recruiting women for mm -hmm. this kind of practices. So patriarchal system, it's even more dangerous when it's injected into the blood mm -hmm. of women. But now you, 
your, 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 your wording, in fact, gives the impression that it is cultural more than religious. And that is, that is important. Uh, it, the, like, like with female circumcision, um, it is part of the culture, and, that's, and, and then it is sort of um, interpreted from the perspective of the religion, so it merged with the religion. And then I see it as our task to sort of separate it again. So this drive to have uh, sex jihad, as you call mm -hmm. it, uh, that is what I understand, not part of traditional Islam. It's not only part of traditional Islam, but also it's not part of the culture either. It's a phenomena which never existed. Which should be demounted. It's a just, it's a just an over-sexualized, pornified group of men who want to have sex for free, and then they came out with this very nice construction. But people believe it. Because Women they, believe it. Yeah, because they use a certain concept in the Islam, which is a jihad, which is actually the biggest jihad in Islam is jihad and nafs which is really to have this consciousness, the pure consciousness in oneself, it is the biggest form of inner struggle. And then they made a transfer from it to the militaire to become warriors, war, mm -hmm. so that's an interpretation which has nothing to do yeah. with culture, it's just serving political issues, and from there, uh, it's like, a, you know, it's like a candy bar where every time you put it in another thing, and then they made also transportation to the sex part also because they just yeah. want to have but sex. Then, then mm. in fact, that, that you, you are proving now the need of us being here, because um, this, this, someone in Germany, um, uh, we, have, we, we need sort of religious uh, archaeology. You, you, you spoke about the bar, but we have, to, we have to, to take the layers off mm -hmm. and then go to the true meaning of that text. Yes. In its, uh, in its setting and yes. in the interpretation of today. Yes. And we have to forget about all the cultural or male humbug, which is a difficult thing because it's political. But, but when, women, when mm. women, this is the difference, when women get interpretation of the texts, women are not mostly interested into war, but into peace. Women are, they know exactly how it is to be sexually objectified and pornified, etc. So when women get the interpretation of the text, you get a completely different interpretation, which is not the male one. So it's not only religious or, or cultural, it's also gender. But do it's we need gender. women to do that or can, could men do it also? Of course, men as well, but women have to take the lead here because women are the victims of that system. So they, it's very important that also they are playing a leading role here. I subscribe to that. I have it at home. <laughs> so the leading role. Yes, that's what many <laughs> men say. Uh, very important, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, can I ask, uh, because it's like we have to go back to the original text, to the theological text, to be able to, to change the perspective. But that means that only very learned people, men or women, can do this job. So it means that 99% of the other people have to wait until the learned men and women that have the answer. That is a dilemma. That is a true dilemma, uh, which in a way also is unreal to, to mm -hmm. ask people to do that or to wait for it. I mean, imagine. Um, so. What, what, mm -hmm. what, is, what is essential is being critical and not being fooled by those uh, horny men who go to war. But that's, that's the very... Okay, uh, what I wanted to say is, is religion only theology? Because I think we can all, from today, from this minute, do something as humans, religious or not. You don't have to be... Because that's always a mantra that the patriarchal people, uh, whether inside or outside religion, say you're a woman, or you haven't studied, or you haven't studied at the right university, uh, so you don't have a voice. And I think, yes, it is important to look at the, at the religious text together, but that doesn't mean we all have to wait for that, because there's a job that needs to be done now. It's we have to get to the peace. It's a matter of podium, because you know, if you look, for example, the, in, in the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and that I'm talking about the seventh century, and uh, uh, the Prophet had very often discussions with his women in his own harem. Like most of his strategy militaire, he found them out also with his women. His first wife was 25 years older than him. It's Macron didn't start the trend. And she was a businesswoman, you know? It's like women in the time of yeah. the Prophet were really strong. And yeah. they were not necessarily scholars. 
or they educated, but yes. they were critical. And there was a discussion because the Prophet gave them a voice. Uh, Fatima Bernisi, one of the most, uh, I love her, uh, Muslim feminist uh, from Morocco, her books are translated in like almost 40 languages. She wrote a book called Le Harem Politique, where she explains also harem. how the Prophet, the Prophet was the first Muslim feminist. He really gave a voice to the women. And you don't have to be a scholar for that. The only thing is, do the media, are, are the media also willing to take gender as a serious issue and to give a podium, to give a podium for women? Because there are enough women around the world who are Muslim and feminist mm -hmm. and who have a voice. The only thing is, we don't give them exposure because we don't take them serious, but they do exist. So, in your uh, <laughs> function as the special envoy, this is a very <laughs> heartfelt plea for the women uh, to get the podium uh, at the levels where decisions are being made, where the big, you know, the, the platforms, uh, even though they are not the religious actors at the moment, your function is to, to focus on religion. How to, how to well, do that? Well, we, when we discuss freedom of religion and belief, uh, which is, let's mm -hmm. say, my, my main task, the advocacy, so to speak, then usually it is indeed very difficult to reach the actors in general, because what you, whom you usually meet are the, the leaders. We work a lot with religious leaders, mm -hmm. usually men, indeed. Uh, but you have as a speaker later on, uh, Asa Karam. Yes. She is Secretary General of Religions for Peace. That is a club of religious leaders. There are women amongst them, but most of them are indeed male. What we, sh and she does, what we should do is to find the women, the actors, including especially the women behind the leaders. That's one. Mm -hmm. Second then is indeed uh, finding the women who usually do not take the liberty or feel the liberty to speak and give them the authority of wisdom as you described yourself referring to Mohammed's Mahara. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then the second episode comes because we then have to give the, to, to respect the authority of these women vis-a-vis -vis in res with respect to the leaders. Mm -hmm. That quite often is also difficult. Mm -hmm. yes. That indeed is part of my job to find them. Mm -hmm. But the problem is find them. To find them, yes. And, uh, and that is and also I part of the government programs, of course, when we, when we discuss WPS, Women, Peace and Security. Yes. And uh, you, you have to reach them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then even we go beyond that, we want to reach the victims. Mm -hmm. The victims usually do not speak. Mm -hmm. If they do, they sometimes get a Nobel Prize. But usually you don't know them. You have to reach them, find them, through all those layers of masculinity and war and politics. Find the individual people and help them. And th mm -hmm. then you help the women in this program. And, and, and Monsieur Dauma, what, what you say is very important because here you address you address the core problem, which is about leadership, because it's not here it's beyond Islam or religion. Leadership, because we know from research that unless you have 30 percent of a certain minority groups, whether it's sexual or gender or whatsoever or ethnic, in, a, in, 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 in leading positions, the Culture will never change. So this is why I know the Netherlands are against quota, but one of the reasons to have quota is unless you have 30%, there will never be a significant change, number one. Number two is I hear very often, because I'm specialized also in female leadership, a lot of people, and especially men, who say, yeah, we don't see them. Even our prime minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte, which I really deeply admire, he has the guts to say in 2017, I cannot see them. Then change your glasses because they are. If you want to see them, they exist. The only thing is we are not, we have gender biases and we did not learn to look with the gender glasses to be able to find them and also to allow them to bring a different kind of leadership. Peace and security, this is very essential for women. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the next statement, indeed, because uh, we're, we're having a discussion. We don't need the statements, but... Ah. Ah. <laughs> feminism, Bring it on. Feminism yes. would never embrace religion as a positive force. Um, that's a negative statement. I have to answer it, eh? Oui, oui. Yes. You, have, you have an opinion about it, no doubt. But I, 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 I should have an opinion about it. And maybe... 
maybe I would subscribe to the statement. That's challenging. Um, because you are confronted with feminists. It's feminism. What is feminism? Yes, you are confronted yes. with feminists. So people express their feelings. And what do these usually women express is the same as you said. It's the, it, religion is patriarchal. At least the religions we mo speak most of uh, are patriarchal. So we feel it is a negative force this from is Western, that perspective. This is Western feminism. Western white feminism have this interpretation. Okay. Ça, c'est la différence. Yeah, Je vous that, en prie. Okay, that's, not that's, one your, that, that's your okay. turn. Oui. Uh, so this is, this is, but it would never, that's, that's number two, would never, uh, mm. it should. And then you say it, it does. But this is a Western statement, so to speak. Well. Uh, because religion indeed can be a positive force. It motivates. And then I have to step a little aside. And in fact, I refer to uh, our, our discussion before this, 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 this discussion. Uh, you refer to the B in my title, FORP. Uh, um, I'm, an, I'm an envoy on religion and belief. And belief stands for all those people who have no religion. But they have drivers. They, have, they are motivated by humanism or whatever. And uh, what struck me is that in, in, in our records, we find, for instance, we find uh, women suffering in Colombia in a religious context, but mainly because of mafia, criminal, mm. drugs, the drugs industry. What, what we find is that both Christians and humanists, they suffer in a country like Colombia. It's not serious, you don't, you don't find Colombia that high in, for instance, the Open Doors Index when it comes to religion, but it's, it's simmering there because the people are afraid to express their religion or belief and manifest that in the political action. And then I come back, we all have drivers, being religious or non-religious, we have drivers. And that is what the B stands for. And then I return to the statement, religion as a positive force or beliefs as a positive force. The trick is belief is something that comes from the human being it, itself, so it's an individual thing, although it of course, <laughs> internalizes <coughs> philosophy, uh, op opinions that you then mm -hmm. take for yourself, you internalize them. Religion is often, maybe too often, depicted as a box, Islam, oh, dogmas. Christianity, yeah. dogmas, indeed. Mm -hmm. Where, as you said yourself, it is, it is, it is a driver. You, you did not use that word, but you, you came back it's to an Islam. Inspiration. And you did not return to those old men sitting there interpreting the Quran. You returned to the belief, to the conviction. And that is, can be a very positive force. Yes, I think that we indeed have to think about the words that we use, that religion, feminism, uh, peace and conflict as well, uh, culture. Those are words that everybody has a perception. And a, about and an association, and an association with, with. That is, that so is it's uh, that also creates like religion here women there and then like this conference also said how can we bring them together whereas if you look under that we all have a drive to live we all have a drive to be in and, peace and, and i think also in, so in, in, in a western culture there is an aspect you asked me in the beginning i would like to know why you were uh, uh, you are born muslim and then you became heretic and then you went back to islam by choice there is an, 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 um, a very beautiful text uh, in the Sufism that says, uh, shaitan. Religion without spirituality is the devil's work. When I moved, I, I, I grew up in Tunisia in a very religious, I mean, it was, it was like a tolerant Muslim. In Tunisia, everybody is Muslim more or less, but okay, it's, it was tolerant. And then my parents, they went into Salafism, uh, very bad timing when I was a teenager. And uh, my Salafism father, is a, is Salafism, very, uh, very, very conservative. Yeah, culture, and my father was going every year to Saudi Arabia and he would spend there four months and every year he comes and then it's, it was getting more and more and more conservative and really, really like it, 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 violent also, a lot of violence, a lot of violence. So I was really traumatized because I, as a child, I went to Madrasa Qur'aniya, the, the, the Quranic school. Mm -hmm. 
with, uh, and also I was at a Catholic school, and in the summer I was a Madrasa Qur'ani, so I grew up with Catholicism, Chris Christianism, and Islam. And when I left to study in Paris, I was so traumatized by religion and by everything that I decided to become Murtada, heretic. That was a drama. So I, I didn't go to Tunisia for three years because I would be killed. And then I remember after three years, I, was, I, was, I missed the spiritual dimension. I didn't know at that time. I missed something. There was something miss missing. There was an inspiration, a drive, a fire. I didn't know where to find it. So I became Buddhist. And I was in the, um, it was the, because the private uh, doctor of the Dalai Lama was a Frenchman, he was in Paris and he was giving a lecture. So I was asking him and I said like, okay, I, be, I am Buddhist and I do everything Buddhist, etc. but I don't feel the passion in my heart. I don't have the connection. And then he says, what is your background? I said, ah, but it's Islam and I don't, and he says to me like, it's not about religion, it's about spirituality. Spirituality doesn't have a color. You can mm -hmm. put it anywhere. And that was for me the switch where I realized what I was missing in the religion is that spiritual dimension. So I went back mm -hmm. to religion because I wanted, that was my, of course we can be spiritual without being religious. But I found out also, which is very uh, 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 interesting, is that in Europe, especially in the Netherlands, people are anti-religious, but they are all Buddhist, you know? <laughs> it's like, why? Because it's sexy to be Buddhist, but it's not sexy to be Protestant or Catholic. Whether at the end it's the same, it's about spiritual experience, which could inspire you and give you the drive to create mm -hmm. a better world as well. Because that's, that's also what religion is about. Yes. Then you have to differentiate, indeed. You, 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 you do it very nicely between spiritualism and the box that you belong in. Uh, you were in the Islam box. Yes. You stepped out. You moved around. And then you returned home. But mm -hmm. the box had changed. Yes. It, was not, it was not that massive thing anymore. And that is, that is part of the problem that uh, in the Middle East, it's all Muslims. No. Not all. No. But, uh, it's not all Muslims. No. So it is, it is very right. And then you have, you, you have m more Muslims than the Muslims you think of. So be open and individualize and listen to the people when they speak about, indeed, their spirituality, which quite often is totally different from the dogmas that you have somewhere in your head as being Muslim. And the same is for Christianity. Yes. And we, we okay, it's, it's difficult, but we have, to, we have to, to understand that there is, there is these institutionalized things, forgive me, and the people who feel to be Buddhist, Muslim, whatever. Yes, thank you. I, I really enjoy this conversation and I think uh, it's getting livelier. We even had only two statements, but then it was nothing more was needed to make you both really uh, say very important things. I have to summarize it a little bit. Um, I think I heard we have to... Uh, also, you can find in each culture, in each religion, in each, the, your own surroundings, the answers for the bigger questions. You don't have to... We, as Western uh, people don't have to say, you know, uh, to come to the countries and, and bring human rights or women's rights, because you can find it in every culture and every religion even, we can find that. So there is, we can all learn from each other, and that's what's probably meant with parity. All cultures and religions and, and, and peoples, they have the answers for their problems. Only maybe we don't see it because there's a very dominant voice uh, in each of the cultures. Uh, so the we have to find voice, the, the female voice is very important in this process. Yes, although there's also not one female voice, but to look, to look further, yes, to look to the people also. So to look, first look for common ground, look, you don't have to really uh, escape, and you're free to do that of course, but your own culture, but uh, see also who you, how you can transform within your culture or religion, uh, but also reach out and, and learn from each other so that uh, people who find superior at both sides can also learn from the others. Um, and indeed uh, transcend to, to humanize, not, not to think of religion as these men in robes who always have dogmas and are negative towards women in, in whatever religion that is, but to humanize it. Who are the people within these uh, groups? Look at the people, at their stories, at their problems, and then you see actually problems in most societies are pretty common. Uh, violence uh, happens everywhere. Uh, we have to address that because if you have violence within the family even, then 
children, women uh, usually are a danger, cannot develop a family, it gets broken, and it, it, it reflects also on to the bigger conflicts of a society, of nations in between. So, so maybe that's what we learned, and I learned also from both of you, and uh, hopefully there will be another c continuum, a continuation of this looking uh, and finding each other, looking to uh, yeah, uh, other speakers and, and looking and searching outside your own silo or bubble. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Merci. both of you. Uh, we will certainly continue. Uh, yep. Your questions also hopefully will inspire the other sessions that are going to happen. And uh, that is why I have to um, round this off. Uh, thank you so much. This face-to-face -face between Kautar, Darmoni, Jos Dauma. Uh, thank you very much both, and thank you for watching. Bye. Merci.